Hello everyone, welcome to our panel discussion, which is part of the Sporulation Exhibition. Welcome. Um, tonight um, we're going to be discussing um, all of the latest research um, and where the general state of play is uh, using plant medicines and psychedelic medicines in the field of mental health, among other things. Before we begin, I'd like to do an acknowledgement that tonight's event is happening in Darawal country, the land of the Wadi Wadi people, and I'd like to pay respects to elders past, present and emerging. Later on tonight, we're going to have a chance for questions from the audience and you'll be able to ask our panelists any questions that you might like to know more about. We recognize that tonight's, the material tonight may bring up some big feelings for people. Um, so I would encourage you to take care of yourself as best as possible, as well as knowing that we have two, two people who have volunteered their services following for support. So if that's the case for you, please just make yourself known to us following the group and we'll take care of it. Great, so without further ado, I would like to hand over to Kate Furman. Hi everybody, uh, lovely to be here. And I also want to acknowledge that we are here today on Darawal country, which is stolen land, Aboriginal land that was never ceded. And this always was, always will be Aboriginal land. Uh, my name's Kate Fairman. I'm a Greens Member of Parliament in the New South Wales Upper House. Uh, I have the Drug Law Reform and Harm Reduction portfolio. And you might wonder, why is this some random Greens Member of Parliament from Olive in Redfern, Sydney? Why was uh, she invited to uh, come down and be at the closing night, as I understand, of this wonderful um, uh, few days uh, wonderful discussion and celebration of all things psilocybin and thank you uh, Mel Airy for uh, putting this on. Actually let's just do a big round of applause for Mel. <laughs> Honestly like I can't imagine the effort and the energy and the stress that has that has gone into to putting this on so thank you. Um, and when Mel uh, approached me I thought, yes, this is one of my passions. Um, I have been trying to get uh, drug law reform here in New South Wales on pretty much every uh, issue in terms of currently illegal drugs, to be honest. I may have written an opinion piece in the Sydney Morning Herald a couple of years ago when all of the furor, when we had Gladys's uh, premiere and when we had those terrible deaths at music festivals from MDMA, but the way in which it was taken and the strength and everything else and uh, what was in those drugs that we didn't know and those uh, people didn't know uh, when they were taking them. And I, there was a time when Gladys was interviewed by Koshi for Sunrise and Koshi was going, come on, come on, Premier, like surely you have taken drugs, illegal drugs at some point in your life, surely you have done this. And Gladys goes, no, Koshi. And I am one of the few people I know who hasn't. <laughs> and this is the Premier of New South Wales uh, kind of dictating, if you like, this, this policy and being so firm in her belief that it was the right thing to do despite people dying on her watch. And she admitted that she was one of the few people she knew who did not take illegal drugs. And at that point, as somebody who has at that point, I just went, oh, I can't stand this anymore. And I wrote an opinion piece. And I wasn't, um, I think it's really important when you hear politicians who confess to drug use. Most of the time when they tell you that they had one little incident at university and they didn't inhale or one little incident that they regret or whatever, they are lying. Of course, that wasn't the case. Um, and I just confessed to MDMA. And I said, I have, was one of those people who went to a lot of dance parties in my 20s, it was in the 90s. And I've taken MDMA in my 20s and my 30s and my 40s. And I know why people take it and I've experienced it. And I know that you cannot say no to, to kids, 
to, to, to young people. I know why they take drugs because I um, was uh, a young person who uh, uh, took MDMA and I have continued throughout my life, and as a politician I am open about this, to, for various reasons, um, uh, consuming certain substances that may be illicit at certain times for certain things. So we're here in terms of psilocybin. So I'll admit to that as well right now tonight. <laughs> psilocybin and uh, LSD as well. And I will tell a story about my first time with uh, magic mushrooms. And this is live. I forgot about that. Great. So I <laughs> Great. OK, so the first time was um, in my 20s with my uh, group of friends. And we were out in Queensland. and. I remember, anyway, um, uh, so we, had, we drank this awful concoction and um, I remember we were in the paddock sitting down looking at the clouds and I remember all the clouds were very evil and they had all these evil faces and they were kind of, I was like, oh my God, this is terrible, what is happening? And my friend just went, Kate, turn them into happy faces. And I went, bring? Like, and it's like, that is, as we know, with, with treatment, with MDMA treatment, which we'll hear about tonight, I'm not an expert on this, we, with the experts are behind me. Um, but I have, uh, as we know, it is about setting, it is about um, having uh, safe, loving people around you. We know it can be incredibly transformative. I believe it changes minds. I believe it changes, changes communities. I believe it's incredibly important that um, it can be life-changing. And uh, I think the, a lot of the drugs that are currently illegal have a, have a really big role to play in healing the world. Well, I have a legalised cannabis um, bill before the New South Wales Parliament as well. Uh, I speak openly about CBD oil, uh, using that for a fractured shoulder. Um, I gave a speech in Parliament about that, obtained the CBD illegally. I had prescribed, been prescribed Endone for that fractured shoulder. And it was terrible in terms of the, the, um, what that was doing to me, trying to speak in Parliament, like trying to have a clear mind. And I have a history of my mother was a terrible, um, was terribly addicted to prescription drugs. So, we know the difference, I think, when we see the history of people trying to deal with trauma and pain through currently legal drugs compared to the potential for psilocybin, which is why we're here tonight, uh, the potential for it to be so life-changing. So I am, from politics, uh, from the political perspective, it is incredibly disappointing that we have this uh, psilocybin, we'll just stick with that, that has so much potential that the research is saying that we'll hear about tonight can literally uh, decrease at a really incredible rate the amount of people in our society who are experiencing depression, PTSD, uh, anxiety, so many different things. And we have post-floods, post-bushfires, COVID, climate change, climate emergency. There is a lot of reasons why, including rising inequality, homelessness, all of that, we are only going to see an increase in the number of people who are suffering mental health issues. So it is absolutely crazy that we are still struggling now to, to, to get access to these drugs. So we've got the TGA. Uh, at the moment, you know that um, the TGA has the uh, did consider the MDMA and psilocybin application of mind medicine. There was a lot of submissions to that. They then said no. There's a second. Uh, there's been a second application. I understand that it hasn't quite gone open to, uh, any day now. Any day now. So we will be uh, promoting the submissions to that so that TGA can reduce these drugs from the Schedule Nine to Schedule Eight. And I think in Schedule 8, you know, that's where like Endone and all those like really, really awful addicted, addictive prescription drugs are at where we've got people who are like the opioid crisis, right? Let's get, this, get these drugs from Schedule 9 to Schedule 8. 
with all these kind of other drugs that are terribly addicted, I personally think they should be beyond, um, with, you know, coming down legalised, basically, with appropriate education and um, able to access these drugs, obviously, for treatment. That's what we're talking about tonight. It's about, um, you know, psilocybin for mental health, and there's a lot of people who are doing incredible research here. I honestly feel from, you know, being the, the young 20-year-old um, uh, experiencing psilocybin and magic mushrooms, and, you know, I'm not going to say what I've done through 20s and 30s, uh, 30s and 40s or whatever, but it is really, really unjust. It has got to a point where the fact that these medicines are currently still illegal and they have been proven across the world. I've heard Professor David Nutt talk about his research. We know how much they work and how many people they can cure. It is criminal that these medicines are still criminalised. So thank you uh, so much for, again, Mel, for this incredible um, awareness raising event, awareness raising event of this extremely powerful life-changing medicine that has been around obviously for thousands of years with a really important role to play. And I tell you what, with all of the crises around us and the anger and the division and everything that is going on in this world, don't we need this more than anything? It could not come at a better time for more people to be able to access psilocybin. I'm a uh, true believer, and let's hope that after tonight we have um, many more. So thanks again. Looking forward to the discussion. Kate Furman, thank you very much. Next, we're going to move on to our panel discussion. I'd like to introduce our panelists who have come from different parts of the country to join us tonight. Um, we have Sebastian Job, Liam Engel, Melissa Warner, uh, Georgia Green, Lani Roy and Mark Baxter. Please give our panelists a big round of applause. Um, I'm going to hand the mic to Sebastian. So my name is Sebastian, Sebastian Job. Um, I'm an anthropologist and uh, I've moved into to working on psychedelics and, and entheogens in response initially to my own uh, my own psychic suffering, I should say. Um, but I've moved through a fair bit of that and I'm not going to be talking about that in particular. But that's to give you an indication of kind of where I'm coming from. I haven't consulted with the other panellists, but my spidey sense tells me that, yes, we will be talking about things like anxiety and, and depression and PTSD and addiction and all these other areas where psychedelics are showing such, such promise. And I guess in an older language, which we could call those maladies of the soul. And the, from my perspective, which has always been interested in the, in the philosophical and the anthropological and uh, the political, uh, which has only been amplified by my psychedelic use, I must admit. Um, the malady of the soul I want to talk about is, is a, a more diffuse, but maybe arguably a universal malady of the soul, and that is that we are lost. That here in Wollongong or on the planet, we are fundamentally disoriented. And you don't need psychedelics to know that necessarily. Um, you can get it in a moment of reflection where you've, you notice that your life is getting fed into the abstract money machine, or you, you notice that the abstract money machine is chewing through the living planet that it's producing kind of interstellar levels of inequality which are then consuming our institutions. You have a sense of a, of a kind of abiding, if disorientation is perhaps too small to say, a sort of insanity. Um, on psychedelics, just to speak to a typical experience, um, there's, that sense can get really foregrounded because and I'm talking about across the board, really, with different kinds of psychedelics, that you, what becomes apparent is that the, the everyday reality principle, which occupies us in ordinary life, is a kind of anaesthetized experience, which doesn't, historically, 
and I'm talking about contemporary society, doesn't want to know about these enormous vistas that are opened through these amazing molecules. It's kind of consciously, or it's, it's, it's repressive, and therefore it doesn't, it, it's not only lost, but doesn't know how lost it is. So that's one claim I would make for a typical psychedelic experience, is that it, it just lets you see we're more lost than, we, than, than ordinary consciousness will allow. But if that's all it kind of graced us with, I wouldn't be so keen on it. So the question then is, well, can psychedelics help us to find ourselves? And I, I could break that down in, uh, to, you know, there are really interesting topics, subtopics, with big headings like capitalism, revolution, religion, death, masculinity, femininity, relationships, etc. But the one I just want to touch on, because I don't have a lot of time, is, is the question of the problem of the, or the aspect of being lost, which is nihilism. And uh, just to remind you, you know, we, the kind of contemporary understanding of nihilism owes a lot to the philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche, who said that nihilism is a, is a condition where the question why, which is the question of purpose, the question of meaning, where that question why receives no answer where perhaps it can receive no answer. And I think we know already that, first of all, this is, this is a kind of apprehension of reality which is menacing uh, many people. We also know that when it comes to those maladies of the soul, such as anxiety and depression and addiction and PTSD, that they are co-determined by how you apprehend the larger totality that you're in. They're co-determined by how you think about society, nature, the universe. And if you come to the conclusion that it's a bleak, nowhere, meaningless uh, cage that has no use for you, then that's, a, that's, a, that's part of how you are intellectually locked into your suffering. And the interesting thing about psychedelics, and again you can generalize, is that very frequently they give you not experiences of the confirm meaninglessness, but on the contrary. They give you these profound experiences. They can, but not guaranteed. But profound experiences, are that, or if you sense a profound palpable sense that we are swimming in meaning, that there is that there's meaning from the microbes to the stars. And that is a kind of, of a grace which sometimes comes to a certain, like a kind of an intensity of divine enchantment, which we usually slap a label like mysticism or unitary experience or non-duality or revelation or something on it, but these are words for, for things which are unspeakable, but nonetheless curative. I'm sure I, I wouldn't be surprised if we hear that, that um, or you'll hear it from me now, <laughs> that, that the curative moment, or a, a curative moment in psychedelic therapy, informal or formal, is very often where where you go through and the menacing clouds put on a happy face, where you go, you go through that portal and you are suddenly, um, you're suddenly aware that the previous understanding was a box and now there's an outside. Just one word of caution just to finish up. Um, I don't want to say, therefore, that you have to trust that experience. I don't want to say that everything that, you've, that you learn on ayahuasca or LSD or 5-MeO, DMT, whatever it is, is to be trusted. But I, I do think we, what we can rely upon is that we, had, we do know that we had an experience of being outside of the box of ordinary experience. And we can now triangulate we can now get a bit of distance. We can, we can 
make use of a certain kind of levity, a lightness that comes from knowing that it's possible to apprehend in a very convincing kind of way, and which may well be true, this larger vista. And uh, it's maybe too much to say that it's a cure for nihilism, but I think it can, it can be a way through individually and collectively for a lot of us. I'll finish up there, thanks. Hi, my name's Liam. Um, I'm here today representing Entheogenesis Australis, which is pretty long, so most of us just call it AGA. So on an AGA level, we're what you might call an ethnobotanical organization, which means uh, plant cultures. Um, but you might be able to guess from the name Entheogenesis, um, if you've looked into the origins of that word, that we have a particular interest in psychoactive plants. and so. Um, we have a connection with this issue of psychedelic medicine that I think has brought a lot of us here today. Um, but some more detail on AGA. Uh, I think most of us trace our roots back to an obscure online forum, um, which was an early place for people with this obscure interest um, to hang out. And then as that's kind of evolved, we've also had um, some kind of conference type events, We've got an online webcast going now, we've got a YouTube channel, and we're kind of, you know, getting our shit more together. And I think things like this are snowballing our community to an extent. Um, I think a lot of people here, maybe we um, don't hang out on the same weird forum, but maybe we're interested in psychoactive plants. On a personal level, I do research on illicit drugs, not just psychedelics, but that's where the money's at at the moment. And I also grow heaps of cactus. I really like cactus. Um, and my journey towards uh, psychoactive drugs um, is related to cactus because it is illegally, until you consume it or extract it, it's a legally accessible psychedelic throughout most of Australia. And so when I was young, this had a particular appeal, but it's gone quite past that. I don't know why I'm, I've got so many, but I, I really like them, and that's where I'm at. Uh, anyway, so I don't have anything prepared to say, but on the topic of psychedelic medicine, I think both from my perspective and from an AGA perspective, um, the initial feeling is this is awesome, this is improving access to something that people need and they don't have access to. But I think it's important to draw some divisions or at least recognise some kind of different areas that are at play here. And medicine is one, but I think maybe it's getting too much emphasis. I'm not saying people don't deserve medicine and they don't need it, they surely do. But more importantly, I think a social justice, and from someone who loves cactus, and from EGA who loves psychoactive plants, an environmental justice issue. And I fear if we all focus on medicine as the way to mobilize drug reform, plant reform, then we are not gonna help any of the people or the plants that are connected to psychedelics. Um, because to take it back to right to psilocybin right now, if, that, if the TGA decision passes, this means nothing for most people who use psilocybin, and this means nothing for psilocybin mushrooms. I think that's a concise place to finish. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Liam. I also want to say that EGA has been really fundamental in creating the dialogue between both researchers, people who have experienced psychedelics, and uh, those who are new to the field. And I feel without EGA and their events, we wouldn't have the first clinical trial in Australia uh, that was launched through a, 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 a conversation between Margaret Ross and Rick Dublin at an event in 2017, and Martin Williams. So thank you, EGA. And as for myself, my name is Melissa, and I'm Secretary of PRISM, Psychedelic Research in Science and Medicine. And we're a not-for-profit charity that has pioneered psychedelic research in Australia for the last 11 years. And um, I'm really grateful to be part of a group of collaborators that have a range of expertise from psychology, medicinal chemistry, law, and uh, anthropotanical uh, knowledge and lived experience, which I think is important. And as for my 
lived experience and why I'm on this path, I, I guess <laughs> I um, wasn't the kind of person to take psychedelics. As a, as a young girl, I frequented books like Nietzsche and also shows like Star Trek and attended more Star Trek conventions and parties as a teenager in high school. And um, I guess what those experiences taught me, particularly <laughs> Star Trek, is that their, humanity has a, a potential for a really positive future and that the values of curiosity, uh, communication and collaboration could be used to uh, really explore and create enterprise and uh, meaning. And the world of Carl Sagan remind us that we're all made of star stuff. And it was actually reading Aldous Huxley when I first heard of the word psychedelic, you know, my sheltered upbringing at, at 18. And he describes psychedelics as um, of the plane of art, of perpetual creation, and they one day may serve to heal mental illness in the future. And as someone who was really wanting to become an artist, yet yeah, had a, a parental pressure towards medicine, I, I thought, wow, here's the thing. And my mum had a mental illness as well. So I had a, a deep meaning and a deep hope of being able to support those who experience intergenerational trauma, which I feel is something that's quite prevalent uh, throughout the world and particularly an awareness of in this country um, being on unceded lands and what that means for intergenerational trauma. So I ran into the family room and told my parents, speaking of cactus, mom, dad, we have to take mescaline. Sounds amazing. <laughs> They also didn't know what it was, and we looked it up, and, uh, oh, that's an illegal drug, you can't have that. But in that moment, I also knew I'm going to be a psychedelic scientist. At the time, um, that wish was <laughs> not quite popular with my professors. It wasn't, the research was really early back then. It was 2011 when the, uh, the uh, paper on mystical experience at John Hopkins University showing that peak or mystical experiences and the depth of peak or mystical experience experienced was indicative of healing and growth after a psychedelic experience, very early in the, in the psychedelic renaissance. And I didn't take psychedelics for many years. I was fascinated enough with the science and reading trip reports and reading about Timothy Leary. And, um, but I experienced a, a severe trauma. I dropped out of my neuroscience degree. And I found myself at a point in time where I couldn't even imagine who that Melissa was who was studying neuroscience. Because um, my mind was quite locked in. I didn't have the concentration anymore. I didn't have the peace of mind, the equanimity, to even reply to the university's emails of why I wasn't attending classes. And um, so I did, I did know that I loved psychedelic trance, which I used to study music. I also wanted to try these things I've been reading about for my healing journey. I thought, well, where can I hear psytrance? And where can I uh, safely take a psychedelic? And uh, my parents were very kind in supporting me to go to, to Portugal, where psychedelics and other drugs are decriminalized. And that created, I guess, a sense of safety in my body. And I was able to experience both the clinical, um, a more clinical therapeutic experience with psychedelics and also uh, a transformative music festival in a legal setting, a decriminalized setting. And the personal experience could not have really, no, even though I'd read so much and learned so much from the scientific point of view, the personal experience was truly unique and I couldn't have learned or read about enough to be able to experience that firsthand. And um, leading back to where we are today, that experience further motivated me. And in fact, Timothy Leary's phrase of turn, in, turn on, tune in, drop out, for me it was very much turn on, tune in, show up. And actually as he self-corrected over time, having experienced the, the fallout of the enthusiasm and zeal, and zeal and I guess the zeal of the 60s, um, he actually in the 80s changed with wisdom, changed his uh, iconic phrase from turn on, tune in, drop out to turn on, tune in, boot up. And I returned to university, completed my degree, and was asked to join the board of prison. Also was one of the founding staff members of My Medicine Australia. And I'm now working on a variety of 
different projects, including a 5 Amira DMT trial, supporting uh, our, others, our other board members, Martin Williams, Stephen Bright, on MDMA and psilocybin trials, and also a personal project uh, of uh, psychedelic VR, or cyberdelics, and the idea of creating an idealized preparation and set and setting an immersive space for people to journey and to uh, develop metacognitive skills, meditation skills, in a, in a really safe and tailored and beautiful, artful environment. I feel that we have this opportunity to be able to collaboratively get to know and unlock in each other our own variety and uh, of artful being. I feel like that's what psychedelics have the potential to connect us to. Also, I guess a, a word of caution, these substances that do sensitize us to our, whatever environment we are in, having gone to transformative festivals, I've definitely seen the power in which community play and creativity can enhance and hold and help people grow, and yet also unconstrained or unintentional experiences, how they can actually limit and hold people back, and actually create psychedelic traumas. So I feel that, and also with um, the variety of facilitators, uh, shamans, um, self-appointed, without lineage traditions, um, there's benefits and risks that we need to hold and develop a clinical model which is consistent uh, with both traditional knowledge holders, our recent discoveries in clinical psychology, and uh, informed by neuroscience. And with that, I'd like to pass on. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Georgia. Um, I am, I'd like to start off first by saying that I am not an expert. I am just an artist with a few psychedelic experiences under my belt. Um, I'll be talking a little bit today about my last psychedelic experience, which will also be my final psychedelic experience, um, because it was unfortunately a psychedelic trauma. Um, it was a really, really difficult experience. Um, so I guess for me, a little background on me is I struggled with a significant childhood trauma uh, when I was quite young and from the age of about 13 I was self-medicating with various drugs and a lot of alcohol and I was experimenting with a lot of different things and some things I liked more than others but one thing I really really loved was LSD and I was really excited to do it whenever I did it until this last time which actually ended with me winding up strapped to a bed in Wollongong Hospital. I would first like to say that I am all for the use of psychedelic medicine in a controlled environment, using the right dosage, all that kind of thing. The circumstances under which I un like undertook this trip was that I was coming out of a week-long depressive episode. I was with 10 other people who were also all tripping. It was recreational use. Um, it was unsafe. It wasn't something that I should have done at that time. I walked into the kitchen to get a glass of water. And when I walked back out of the kitchen, the room was black and there were 12 demons lined up in front of me. And they each took me through the 12 levels of hell because I believed that I had overdosed and died. And this was my punishment, was for all these years that I'd been experimenting with drugs, that finally it had all caught up with me, and that now I was going to suffer the consequences in this eternal ring of hell. The one that I remember the most clearly was the lion in the pink tutu. Um, she took a ballet class, and for every step I got wrong, she would break one of my bones. And when all my bones were broken, she would heal me and the whole process would start again. I damaged property um, on, at my friend's house. I had two seizures because I was on medication that should never be mixed with psychedelics. Um, and the ambulance had to be called. And as I said, I woke up strapped to a bed in Wollongong Hospital. 
and the weeks that followed were incredibly traumatic. Um, I had nightmares, recurring nightmares every night about the trip. I crashed the car because I had hallucinations of demons sitting on my dashboard. Um, so I guess I'm just here on this panel as to play a little bit of, not devil's advocate, but to sit in a position where I have had such an experience with psychedelics that I choose not to use them because I am prone to psychosis and because I am prone to addiction. And I don't know if it will ever be an option for me even to use microdoses. Yeah, so I'll just, I'll keep it short. Um, thank you to, for listening to my little story um, and I'll pass along. Thanks everyone. Just want to acknowledge the, everyone on the panel, our friends and artists and past students. <laughs> it's just really great to be here. It's a real privilege to be in this room and to be in Wollongong for the first time. So, yeah, so I'm, my name's Lani. I'm, I guess I'm representing myself, my, my practice, which is the Science of Life Psychology. And in that, I, I work with Melissa supporting student placement, so biomedical psychology and, and social work student placements at, at PRISM and EGA and the Mental Health Foundation Australia. So I guess my passion is really uh, finding, finding my way in this field, um, working with really wise, uh, incredible people and building a, you know, uh, an, an altar from my platform which has integrity and, and friendship and community. So um, yeah, I guess I'll share a little bit about my, my lived experience as well as my professional reflections. So I began uh, using MDMA and LSD at the, the wise age of, of 13. And you know, why, why was I doing that? And now that I've had the, the therapy and the time to reflect and be able to author my experience, you know, I, I was doing that because I, at a very young age, I'd experienced sexual abuse and, and violence. And also, you know, even though I came from a very loving home, my, um, the existential framework that I was raised in was extreme, extremist ev evangelical Christianity, which was quite traumatic for me, even though it came from a good, loving place. Um, so why, why did I turn to substances at that time? And it was because MDMA made me feel safe in my body. It made me feel connected to my friends. You know, many other people were using alcohol and that's okay, but my friends, there was no violence. There was safety, there was connection. I felt empowered in my body. I felt aware of my surroundings and it really helped me to process unconsciously um, shame and, and the trauma that I'd experienced. And then I had, uh, I guess, a bit of a break in my, my adult years. I spent 10 years working as a sexual assault therapist and that's my main my main passion also acknowledging my husband who's a sexual abuse detective um, and the amazing police that do that work um, and yes yeah, so I had 10 years of doing my PhD traveling the world having my babies and then at some point I hit a, um, a big black hole of existential uh, terror and, and dread and I even though I loved my work and I loved life and I loved everything I was doing, I did not have a, an existential framework to hold the darkness that I was working with on a daily basis. So I spent yeah, two years at the peak of my career um, and the peak of when my children needed me oper functioning at a very high level, but also yeah, extreme, extreme terror and, and nihilism and, and contact with the void. Um, and then I, I turned to my husband at one point and I said, I either need to go to the jungle or I need to go to a psychiatric ward. And he said, yeah, I'll, I'll support you. Either way, I'll look after the kids. And yeah, the next day I went um, to Peru and began my journey with, with plant medicines and have never, never looked back. Um, so my, my space, I've got a huge passion for psilocybin, obviously, and working in that space. But my, my passion is the ayahuasca diotero process and just want to acknowledge my master plants that I've worked with in the jungle, which is Bobansana, Chorixanango, Mapacho, Moray, 
Chuchuwasi, and just the incredible gifts that those longer processes um, can give to the trauma body. And in those processes, there is, there's fasting, there's multiple days in ceremony, there's a lot of silence, a lot of time sitting with yourself, and just the incredible communities around Australia and around the world that are living in deep symbiosis with these plant medicines well before pop culture, um, capitalism, uh, the energy of narcissism and all the challenges that are faced in this field. Long before that came along, these people have been sitting you know, by fire in the TP, in the dark, and you know, it takes incredible courage to do these medicines. It's acknowledging your journey. It's not, yeah, it is hard to stay on this path. Um, but it is also deeply, deeply rewarding. And yeah, so from, from that space, I've been able to uh, step into more work with, with Melissa, which is really exciting, just acknowledging our programs together, particularly supporting people through post-traumatic growth after sexual abuse and psychedelics, because it, it, it really is a nuanced space to be able to enter those realms if you've had those experiences. So I've got a lifelong commitment to harm reduction and creating programs to really help um, people go in with as much safety and reflection and um, capacity as possible to be able to yeah, prevent you know, traumatic, um, traumatic experiences, but really um, be able to stabilize the state change that can come, and trait change, sorry, that can come with altered states of consciousness. So, yeah, I think that's, that's me. Gracias again. <laughs> I've got some notes in case I panic. <laughs> Just want to acknowledge people in the panel as well. So yeah, it's such a privilege to be up here with you all. Um, there's so much to talk about with this area of psychedelics. I feel like this is going to feed back. Okay. It, it's something that draws me to this area. There's the pharmacology, the anthropology, the history, the psychology. Um, there's just so many areas to be interested in, but I wanted to talk about something that I think maybe caps off a little bit about what Sebastian introduced, which is an antidote to bleak, intellectual, nihilistic prison. Um, we, we might call it depression sometimes. The thing that, one of the things I like about psychedelic assisted therapy and the influence it's having already is that it's brought the spiritual back into healthcare. And um, I think it's super important that's happening. And I want to talk a little bit about why that is. I mean, there's over a hundred international studies, psilocybin, that are either ongoing or you know in, in development stage. In Australia, there's about seven that are that are being kicked off, and you know in the next ten years, there's going to be plenty more. Um, so the tide's already turned. Uh, you know, the federal government's given something like 14.8 million dollars to, to research in this area for psychedelic assisted therapy. Um, I agree with what Liam said about, you know, we don't want to just keep a focus on the medicinal uh, and healthcare angle here. I think there's this a, a bigger and broader, uh, maybe a seismic shift in our culture and psychedelics aren't the thing that are going to do that, but I think they can play a part. And the part that I think I'm most interested in, as I said, this this sense of the spiritual. So I'm a recovering atheist, recovering um, uh, scientific materialist. So what does that mean? A scientific materialist is someone who thinks that matter makes up the whole of the universe and, and all the phenomena in it. And an atheist is someone who thinks that everyone else has got it wrong. <laughs> so I'm in a process of recovery from those two afflictions and I'm, I'm doing okay. There's some days are better than others. But psychedelics has especially been helpful with that. Um, there's a paper that I think Melissa referenced already, which you know is fundamental because it really did kick off probably this next part of the psychedelic renaissance, or so had a big deal to do with it. And a guy called Roland Griffiths and a team out of um, John Hopkins University in in Baltimore in in America, they released a paper. This paper title is classic: "Psilocybin can occasion mystical type experiences having substantial and sustained personal meaning and spiritual significance." What a crazy title. 
Apparently you named it so because to, to, to put mystical experiences in a scientific paper is just murderous to your career. And so he thought if he added 18 other words around it, he could sort of get away with it somehow. And he succeeded. And the team there succeeded. And from there, there's been so many attempts to describe why and how psilocybin works. There's brain imaging attempts. There's uh, attempts looking at, um, oh, I won't go into all the details, we're going to a small amount of time, but one of the frameworks we can look at it that's not a neuroscience framework, but is a different framework, is this kind of spiritual, mystical kind of framework. What they found through this study is pretty significant. So um, besides you know, helping kick this off again, they found that, and, and besides putting the mystical and spiritual back on the, the, the healthcare agenda as a significant aspect of people's lived experience, they found that these experiences that were engendered through this, these psychedelic experiences, these psilocybin experiences, were so memorable, were so personally meaningful that people were rating them as high as you know, the, the birth of their first child and the death of a parent. So these were, years later, people would, would describe them as being that meaningful. Not only that, but they predict positive uh, behavior change and sustained behavior change. So one of the best predictors is, is a person going to stop smoking? Is a person going to give up alcohol? Is a person going to recover from depression? These are some of the studies that they're looking at. One of the best predictors of that is, did they have a mystical type experience and, and how deep was that? So I think that's phenomenal. The other thing, which is the, the biggest deal, is that we can actually create the conditions where a mystical experience shows up. Now, other, outside this, it's, you just got to kind of wait for a strike of lightning or an act of God, literally. Like, what do you do? How do you get a mystical experience? You go into the forest for 20 years and hope for the best. That's pretty much, you know, all I thought, you know, was possible. So when an atheist materialist hears that you can engender a mystical experience, you know, he gets fascinated. So what that person did is they, they, they took the um, study and diligently went through it replicated it, did it at home, which I don't recommend, but it went well. And, you know, so what happened is I had one of those mystical experiences. Now, what do we mean by that? Well, there's, there's kind of six qualities of a mystical experience, depending on what model you're looking at. But one of the elements is that there's a profound sense of unity of all things, a complete oneness. There's a sense of sacredness, reverence, or preciousness about the experience. And there's a noetic quality, so that's a compelling sense that this experience is as real as ordinary human consciousness, or even more real. There's a sense of elevated mood, intense joy, love, or compassion. There's a collapsing of time, so the totality of linear time is coming into the right now, or there's a vast infinite sense of time. And this word, which is hard to say, ineffability, which means you can't put it into words. And so if you've ever heard anyone talk about their psychedelic experiences or you've ever tried to, you'll notice you start bumbling around and you start saying things like, I was full of love and the universe was love and I just became very loving and, and, and I'm just different now. And it doesn't sound very great. But you know when you, if you've had these experiences and you talk to someone like that, you can kind of feel that. And I think the difference in these experiences is that we can come out of sometimes these nihilistic, bleak, intellectual prisons because we feel into something so big and so profound and so deep that it moves you in such a way that you realize that love is not just something that is in the universe, but love is something that's very personal and is directed at you. Now that is unbelievable for someone who's depressed. So what happened as I came out of that mystical experience and the, and, the, and the experiment was successful, when I woke up the next day, I realized something really crazy. And that's that my depression was gone. Now, gone is a really strange feeling. So for my whole life, I've managed depression. If anyone here who's, who's had depression before knows what to manage depression is like, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You exercise, you see people, you have fish oil, you meditate. You have swims, mental health chores, I call them. 
And it's just a long list of mental health chores. And sometimes the, the mental health delights and we feel connected to the earth and to others. And other times we're just doing what we need to do so we don't fall into a, a bleak hole. So for the first time ever, that management was gone. And it was just me and just the world. And you know, to say that was profound is an understatement. Now, to be fair, I want to say that that went away again. Um, after four, five or six months, that, that, that left again. I had to manage depression again. And I want to say that because I think the reality is, is that these medicines are rarely one-shot wonders. They're rarely a silver bullet. They're, they're part of a much bigger picture of therapy and reconnection and getting back into nature and all these different things. But they do give people uh, a window into a state of being that is... Uh, profound and deep and connected and untainted by what scientists, neuroscientists call the default mode network gone wrong, which is this attack, uh, self-referential attack of the mind, critical, self-loathing, uh, narcissistic, self-absorbed, but just when the mind starts attacking its own person. Um, to have freedom from that gives an opportunity to, to do other things and reconnect in different ways. So what's my message tonight? One is that um, there's so much promise here and a lot of people feel that and know that. And the other message is that, you know, healthcare and mental health and community is much bigger than just psychedelics, but I definitely think psychedelics are gonna play a part here. And the last one is that, you know, this, this sense of something bigger and greater and beyond us is incredibly healing, um, big time healing to an atheist materialist, but, but healing to all of us. Um, so I think I'll leave it there, thanks. Thank you very much, panel. Um, when we talked about this exhibition right from the beginning, we wanted to include a an opportunity um, for the community to come together um, to think about some of the questions that we've been hearing tonight um, and to f somehow create a way for us to interact around it in a, in a safe space. So what we're going to do now is invite you guys to ask the panel some questions. Um, just on the topic of the management, um, and we're talking about mental health and the, the amount of hard work that, that it involves. And with psychedelics, I, I'm somebody that has um, suffers from bipolar and I've had several episodes in the past and it is definitely hard work. There's a lot of management um, because it doesn't just involve the lows, it involves the highs as well. So when we're talking about um, the idea of um, introducing psychedelics in therapy, I have this concern and curiosity of how that um, idea of management it will be, um, we will consider for people that economically it's not affordable or it's not, um, it's not something that, say, you do trigger and open up the can of worms and then what happens? How do we um, safeguard so that, that um, yeah, that, that whatever does get out of control can be managed and ongoingly because we don't really understand, um, the, can't predict what the consequences might be. Um, I guess that's just sort of a blasé sort of question, but on that topic of management, um, what are your thoughts on that? I think that's a really good question. Uh, I think there's a real need here to balance uh, risk mitigation, knowledge, and uh, an individual focus as well, and the need for further research, because the fact is we don't have any research into how psychedelics would affect bipolar or some more complex mental illnesses such as schizophrenia or even personality disorders. There's a lot of uh, knowledge out in the community. And I think it's also really interesting to just reflect on why we don't know 
in terms of research at this point in time. And that is because we are at this really early phase where there has been a need for research to create outcomes so that there can be future progress and greater nuance created through knowledge development. But in this early phase of research, there's been a need to actually really narrow down uh, the conditions that we are investigating. Because as you mentioned, there is higher risk uh, in, 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 st in uh, conditions where there is, I guess, greater complexity and also greater, I guess, uh, instability, there is a risk that you could push somebody into an unsafe place. Now, I do feel that there is a set and setting and potentially a dose and also a, a way of holding for a variety of conditions. We just don't know the details of that yet, particularly for bipolar, there is some early uh, observational research being carried out by actually an Australian, Benjamin Mudge, who's currently in England. And what he seems to suggest from his early observational research is that potentially things like, in the case of bipolar, microdosing or mini dosing during depressive episodes and abstaining and avoiding psychedelic use during manic episodes might be a way of uh, being able to utilize psychedelics to enhance the stability of somebody with that condition. Uh, as for other disorders, if you look at Stanislav Groff's work with people with complex personality disorder, what he found was that this whole one to three dose uh, idea that Mark actually touched on, that there is this, there is potentially the need for uh, booster doses or going in. The whole idea of uh, Alan Watts's quote of, once you get the message, hang up the phone. I think there are actually lots of messages and you actually need to be reminded of the message potentially over time. And I think there is, is value in us investigating that, I guess, refractory period or that period in which there is benefit, but how, how long that diminishes and what the, are the, um, what are the, what's the circumstances and how do we hold individuals in maintaining the insights, integrating the insights of a journey. I know for Ibogaine, for example, uh, with, um, addiction and addiction disorders, there, there is the idea of, of top booster doses, microdosing after the, the acute uh, main dose. We don't have research with psilocybin or even MDMA yet to be actually able to create a protocol for this, but I think this is, that's the next phase, to create nuance around different conditions. Thanks, Melissa. <laughs> Uh, I also have a bipolar diagnosis. Um, it's, it's actually some, some uh, good things to say about it, I think. Um, but in terms of what's difficult for us within the medical context, uh, because we are considered high risk, any, uh, us getting medical access to psychedelics is, is really far off. Um, so I think Melissa's advice of monitoring the highs and the lows, and if you are going to do it, doing it at a stable period, is, is probably the, the main piece of advice. And if um, you know people don't want to deal with you in a medical context because they don't want to seem supportive of this, some may, then harm reduction services are awesome. They're really experienced dealing with people having psychedelic experiences too, and um, they don't need to know your diagnosis necessarily, and they don't need to know why you're doing it, but they, they can offer you know support, so you can do it how you want to do it. Also, say thanks for sharing and for your vulnerability. Yeah, it's an important question. Um, just quickly, I'm gonna third that. I also have the bipolar diagnosis, um, which is why my trip went so badly because of the medication that I was on. My psychiatrist believes that it was the trip actually triggered I, a psychotic episode in me. So with bipolar, you can have bipolar, which just causes, you know, your lows and your highs, but you can also have bipolar that can cause hallucinations and psychosis. So I think that depending on the type of bipolar you have and whether or not you've experienced psychosis or not, I think that that can make a big difference in whether or not you should experiment with um, psychedelics. But again, I'm not an expert on that. Um, this is just what my psychiatrist kind of said to me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just um, to add to that, I work with a lot of people in the community who have 
uh, bipolar or complex PTSD, dissociative disorders, or, or all of them at the same time. And if they've set their intention to, to work with psychedelics, we, we tend to do a bit of a stepped position around um, the holding and the plan. And often it starts with exploring altered states of consciousness without psychedelics first. So through their own meditation, trance states, drumming, holotropic breath work, um, expanding their, I guess, um, depth and complexity to hold altered states of consciousness and, and to feel into that. And often as that occurs, their sense of spirituality and um, I guess metacognitive skills with monitoring their body and their thoughts and their feelings starts to expand. And then in that, try and think about the safest option. Is it, is it CBD and THC first to help maybe ground into their body, then MDMA, psilocybin, um, or San Pedro, and maybe, you know, ayahuasca a little bit later down the track. And um, also a lot of planning with the family. You know, is the family supportive of them doing the psychedelics? Are they able to hold another episode? Is it worth the risk? And for some people, it absolutely is. They, they make that commitment that they, they believe it is worth the risk. For others, um, it's not. And it's about what other ways can they explore um, altered states of consciousness. And because they're, they're, they're seek, often seeking that um, depth and connection and existential realms, which don't always have to be found through psychedelics. There's many other means of that as well. And yeah, thank you everyone for the, um, your time here tonight. It is really um, it's fantastic to really to be part of hearing this. Um, I've just got, I'm curious to hear about the, uh, whether there is any research or what your views are about the using of psychedelics on young people who experience severe um, anxiety and depression and who have gone through other di all the a myriad of um, therapies to manage that with um, a little bit, Mark, you were saying, doing all those keep up and that mental health, um, fitness, if you like, to be able to, to be well, but can reach there. So it is a developing brain, it is young people. What are your thoughts about that and psychedelics to, to help me manage um, severe depression? I can pass it over to someone else, but I think it's interesting to consider that um, the different worldviews and cosmologies around altered states, the, the lineage that I'm a part of, children as young as 10 do ayahuasca dietas, and that's, that's normal, and that's embedded and supported in the, the culture and the community. Whereas, you know, in Australia, do we have the culture that can support young people to have um, peak or mystical experiences? I, um, I think it's quite risky given the context we're in at the moment, but someone else like to add to that? Right, research? Yeah. It's, I mean, of course, it's really controversial, you know, uh, experiments with developing minds, you know, very controversial. I, th I think one thing we need to, and the research has to be there. We're not going to muck around with this, obviously. One thing that's interesting, though, is we, when we think about drugs, we, I, we, we place them all in a container, and, and in that container we have an assumption. That assumption is, is that drugs are bad for the brain in some way. Now, Yale University is doing a lot of work in this area, as are some others, looking at the neurogenesis, positive neurogenesis, neuroplasticity that is caused by LSD and by psilocybin. And so they're looking at it to actually help with functional neuronal disorder, with um, CTEs, with, with brain damage, with Parkinson's, things like that. So we're looking at these kinds of compounds, these kind of natural and, and synthetic, I guess, compounds, as ways to heal the brain rather than hurt the brain. So, you know, it's a strange thing to hold because we have this assumption. So I don't know the answer to your question, but I think we've got a lot to rethink when we come to, you know, thinking about these as drugs. I love the quote from Buffy the Vampire Slayer that <laughs> you, want, you want to be open-minded, but not so open-minded your brains fall out. And... I guess why I bring it up is that psychedelics have been shown to increase the personality domain of openness, which is one of the big five, Myers-Briggs big five, and has been correlated with positive life outcomes and creativity, ease in, in navigating complex ideas, philosophical ideas, uh, connection to others, connection to the world, and also artistic skill and also potentially schizotypal behaviors as well. So what's also interesting in terms of psychedelics is that they 
going back to this idea of creativity, that openness can uh, enhance in one's experience this, uh, this exploration of ideas and the embodiment of ideas through creative tasks and exploration. Psychedelics have been shown to increase divergent thinking, which is a key aspect of creativity. There's uh, divergent thinking and also convergent thinking to the key cognitive faculties of creativity. A divergent thinking is brainstorming, coming up with new solutions, new ideas, new ways of thinking, and psychedelics definitely enhance that. But there's also convergent thinking, which is selecting the right idea out of many and creating an action plan and a path and, and the execution of that idea. And we do see that in novice psychedelic users, acutely convergent thinking decreases, while divergent does increase both acutely and post-acutely, uh, even weeks later. Now, the uh, effect on convergent thinking diminishes with frequency of use and experience in the psychedelic state, but it's not enhanced by psychedelics. Jumping slightly, but I think I'll bring these, tough, these ideas together, is if you look at, for example, um, psychotic breaks or challenges after Vipassana, a 10-day meditation retreat, there actually is a surprising number of individuals who go to a Vipassana, a 10-day silent retreat, and come out with actually some kind of psychological harm or trauma. And it's not so much the acute experience, but the way that they uh, they are held after this peak or mystical experience, which they often do not have an interpretive frame for. Our culture doesn't have a lens and a way of holding these states that one might experience in a 10-day retreat or a psilocybin journey. And without that community holding, without that knowledge structure, without that, uh, that cultural wisdom, there is an increased risk of psychosis or harm, which doesn't occur in, in Nepal or in countries where there is that, that lineage of, of wisdom and holding occurs a lot uh, less commonly. Sorry, yeah, less commonly. So when I think about introducing psychedelics to young people, I think, well, how do we help them frame that experience? How do we prepare them for that experience? How do we help them integrate that experience? And are they, do they have individuals elders or peers uh, who have gone through that and will be able to support them in making the right, or not making the right, but making uh, interpretations and holding their own, I guess, and developing their own sense of, of loving wisdom to be able to navigate and actually uh, enhance their lives from those experiences. I think we don't have that now. I think there's a real lack of rites of passage in our culture. I think it's, it's in, as I mentioned before, my experience of transformational festivals, I feel like that it is filling a gap, but it's still quite unstructured. And it's, it's, there's a lack of, for example, elders potentially present, although there definitely are some, but there's, and there's definitely a, a lack of legality around the whole context. So it's not entirely safe, and it's not, uh, not held by the broader community. So I think that's something to, to look at and work towards. That being said, before MDMA is legalized, before it is uh, approved by the FDA, uh, as part of the FDA approval process, there has to be trials in young people. So we will see results of uh, MDMA for PTSD coming out of the approval process through the FDA. Thanks, Melissa. Um, over the course of the over the course of the exhibition, we've been collecting questions from the community, and actually, there's a really terrific follow-up question um, around the same sort of theme. Is there any advocacy occurring which supports ceremony as opposed to purely clinical approaches? Well, I'm working working on a trial personally about the the uh, ayahuasca dietero di space, which is very much uh, the community, as I said, have been have been using these medicines for a very long time. They have their own protocols. They have their own practices. Of, you know, rich, rich culture, heritage, and you know they largely do this completely off the grid and without government support or intervention. And you know, it's my passion to interview these people for their culture, their community, their practices. Um, what are what are their tips and tools for preparation, integration, and and altered states 
and what can we learn from them for how did they, how are they supporting and sustaining safety in the community? You know, and I, and I want to acknowledge obviously there's risks in in medicine circles, like there is risks in, in in all the things we do in life. But from my from my experience, working in this space is that it it's it's incredible what people are doing out there, and it, it should not be illegal. It should not be something people should be ashamed to talk about. And yeah, I'm really excited. I'll be working um, with Melissa and um, several other uh, leading researchers in Australia to, to bring that study forward later this year. Yeah. Thanks, Lani. Would anyone Anything else on else the panel think? like to comment? Um, I think uh, one thing, just with the mention of ceremony that is worth keeping in mind, is often we kind of carry with that some assumptions that it's attached to like an indigenous tradition. Um, and I think that's awesome and really interesting. Um, but I also like am concerned when we're using uh, indigenous frameworks that might not relate to us to frame these experiences. And I, th I still think they're interesting and have huge value. But I think what we were talking about is missing before is like we don't have a cultural framework or a mythology or a context to experience God. Like it's, it's absolute madness to like live in the modern world. Atheism is the truth. Discover God. And what the hell are you going to do? So I think um, we need to like, yeah, we need some sense of that in community for the youth in Australia um, to achieve that. And I have no idea how we're going to do it, but like that's, that's what's up. I really resonate with that. And I, bringing back Mark's idea of recovering atheists, attended also in my teens the atheist convention, carried a I am a skeptic card in my wallet. <laughs> card carrying skeptic, it said. <laughs> And I still am, I guess, in a way, but um, there is a certain trust or a certain uh, connection, I guess, a tether that will never be broken now that I've experienced it to what Huxley described as perpetual creation. And bringing back this idea of our community lacking the holding of, of, a, of a mythical or a, a ritual-based uh, holding for these experiences, I also think there's um, not, not so much a risk, but being aware of potentially latching on to, once you have discovered um, perpetual creation, connection with the universe, God, um, the great dancer at the edge of the universe who kicked dancers, kicked her, kicked their bills into existence, whatever you want to call it. Um, once you have that, that tether, I think it can be a very, it can be a very unique journey and there's not necessarily the need to latch on to existing frameworks but to help people create their own. Uh, and so one of the things that is coming out, for example, John Hopkins University, this idea of not bringing in sculptures of the Buddha or of uh, Hindu gods or even uh, ayahuasca-themed imagery, but allowing people to really nurture their own language around the divine and encouraging a, a pathway, a supported pathway for that, which I guess is holding what I feel is the best of what I learned from um, my interest in non-secular uh, and evidence-based uh, knowledge with an appreciation for the potential of a, a connection to something much larger than us. Thanks, Mel. Thank you. Um, we'd just like to make an invitation to people online too, if they do have a question, that they could type it into the comments and we'll, we'll check in in a minute. Yeah, I'd just like to follow on from what Liam and Melissa were saying. I mean, we've got to remember that these substances have been used since the beginning of humankind for tens of thousands of years. And it's really the only last 70 in which we've been told that they're not safe and that they have a high risk of abuse which these clinical trials do definitely prove safety and efficacy, which is great. But I think the dominant corporate narrative that sort of puts forward the idea that psychedelics are only for sick people is it risks alienating a vast majority of the people that already consume psychedelics. For example, the people in Santo Daime, ayahuasca religion that holds ayahuasca sacrament, um, around the world. Um, so I sort of see we're at a bit of an impasse with, you know, $18 billion a year being put into 
the corporatization and medicalization of psychedelics, yet very little work being done to decriminalize, which would then allow us to build community frameworks, modern day mystery schools, in which they're non-denominational, agnostic people can choose the frameworks, the conceptual frameworks that resonate with them in order to interpret their experience where there's good screening, there's good uh, pre-medical checks for contraindications and general health and well-being and integration follow-up. Um, yeah, not really a question, just a statement. <laughs> but um, do, you, do you think that this dominant focus on medicalization and clinicalization of psychedelics risks alienating the people that use psychedelics already for as as bill richard said and michael pollan reiterated in his book psychedelics are medicine for well people it's important of course to uh understand the the, the difference between decriminalization and legalization first and um the the kind of framework that you were suggesting in terms of decriminalisation, which is the Portugal model, if you like, I've been to Portugal as well, um, and uh, went to a harm reduction international conference and spent a fascinating day in Lisbon meeting with uh, the head of what is called there the Dissuasion Commission. That if you, because of course taking, there is no legal supply of, of drugs in, in, in Portugal. You still have to, in terms of, um, depending on the drug, but it's decriminalised, but there is still, you still have to get it. You're not getting it from a place where you get the education and the information and you're asked if you're taking certain prescription drugs that might um, you know, be terrible to take with that. You still just have to, to get it from a supplier, if you like. Um, that's the big difference. So, so, so first we need to, to recognise that decriminalisation won't solve the problem of uh, uh, where to get uh, dr drugs that are currently illegal, where to buy them so that you know what you're taking, so that you know all of that, right? So if we're talking about the supply of this, I, I agree with the, the premise of your question. We need to talk about a regulated market or a, a, a market in which, for example, whether it's from you know, some certain countries, for example, in terms of heroin, have prescription heroin so that people don't uh, uh, they're not they're, people who still need to take that drug are, are taking it um, legally. In terms of uh, psilocybin, MDMA, I think we're talking about a regulated market, so that people who uh, they know where to get, um, say, for example, you know, psilocybin for a weekend, um, and it's very different to treatment. And I know that. Talking about this from a political perspective is risky for me, um, not from a personal perspective, but it kind of gets the people who are saying, this is all about legalising all drugs and having this free for all. Um, it, it takes away, uh, it, it brings the attacks on, if you like. So if we talk about medicinal cannabis, the fact that we have um, medicinal cannabis now largely legal in this country. That was a bit of a journey to get there. We've, and it's really good that we're there. I think if we look at the, the pathway and the, the, the journey, if you like, around the world with currently illegal drugs, we first start with a, if you like, almost like a medicinal framework. Like that's kind of where we've started with, with cannabis. Uh, I think it's where we're going with psilocybin. It's where we're going with MDMA. It's where we're going with ketamine. My goodness, almost every, you know, except methamphetamine and heroin, probably, you know, we're kind of largely, most of the, the kind of drugs that people are taking for personal use, recreational use, they're actually there's a reason why so many people take them. There's a reason why, you know, almost one in um, uh, uh, two people take them. So I'm not going to say here whether I completely support um, that because that would be a bad thing for me to say with that thing um, going on over there. The, uh, the, the, we have a policy, our policy within our party is legalising cannabis. We have just got to MDMA within that as well, within the Greens New South Wales. We haven't got any further. Um, but if you look around the world at the progress, it is a very gently, gently 
because of the, I know, and the, the expressions on people's faces, but in some ways I feel like it almost has to be within our current political framework because of the Murdoch media, because of how hard it is to just get anything across the line. One example, I'll finish on this, is right now I've got a, I've got a bill before the parliament, which is currently now, there's an inquiry into it, into the awful roadside drug testing regime, which means that people who are taking medicinal cannabis cannot drive. So we might actually get an outcome on that. Um, I've had some conservative MPs going, it is absolutely crazy. It's like this, it's like medicinal cannabis, we've got that legal, then our roads, our criminal, you know, crim, our laws haven't kept, kept up with that. So I think we're going to get action on that. And it's like, let's not scare the horses too much by talking about legalised cannabis. We'll get the RDT. So that's the very boring political uh, reality. Uh, let's, uh, maybe that's the last time I'll speak because I love all of this conversation over here and I just brought the politics into it. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> sorry, I, I can't resist taking the bait on bringing the politics into it. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I, th I think the, we're in this sort of cultural learning moment, you know, uh, where between us and, and the drugs, in the in the in the non-pejorative sense, uh, there's there are all of these formal and informal uh, structures, processes, intentions, forms of discourse, and w a, a few things I just want to say about that. One is that you're we're going to need to have, and we already do have, and it's a good thing we have horses for courses. You know, some people are extremely safety oriented, and probably for good reason. And some people are pretty wild, right? And some people are wild and then safety conscious. You know, uh, depending on how how things went. And we 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 need a kind of cultural suppleness, I think, where forms of invention. Uh, encouraged. One thing I think we can hope for in that respect, and I think maybe this could address, or not address, but touch on the issue of younger people and psychedelics. Um, one, one thing we, we can hope for is that we are going to delegitimize the punitive approach without necessarily getting rid of it. So what we when we speak about the psychedelic renaissance, we can see that in some ways it's gone way ahead of the law, and yet it's tolerated in some sense, right? Uh, in many jurisdictions. Of course, so, the, so there's this kind of careful talk, etc. But but the, the science and the, also the interest of capital has emerged in a context where there's still not legislative freedom. Um, but But... What has happened is that the punitive approach has been pushed back. Like it doesn't have the kind of cultural authority. So if we can work on that premise, then I think we don't just have to have an approach of, in, in the political sense, of what are the good policy initiatives that we can campaign for. We can also have an, which is important, but we can also have an approach of how do we, as human beings, you know, having this little bit of time on Earth, how do we push forward the mystery schools? How do we um, help the activists uh, who, need, who need to debrief, reconnect, conflict, uh, get through their, their conflicts, have some conflict resolution, etc.? There are many fields of application, I think, of these incredible substances, and I, th I think the the richness is not at all the richness of response of human cultural response is not only at the at the level of legislation or the level of studies or uh, of policies sorry but i have to say this because uh, drug policy is really important to me and i think particularly in this issue we're talking about where we're talking about kind of incremental movements, various Trojan horses for drug reform, and wondering some people are agreeing and using this Trojan horse and some people are disagreeing with it. I think it's good at least to keep in, in mind that it, it is a Trojan horse and what's going on behind the scenes. 
And I think three words that I want to use in this explanation are medicalization, prohibition, and decriminalization. So as I understand it, the majority of drug harms are caused by prohibition. And that's why um, medicalization doesn't work, because it doesn't challenge prohibition. And that's also the fundamental limitation of decriminalization, is because decriminalization assumes drugs are criminal. So decriminalization is still prohibition. Um, I will stop. <laughs> I guess I just wanted to acknowledge um you mentioned the uh, potential alienation between those in the, the mystery school, the modern day mystery school, with the, the medical model. And I, I just wanted to acknowledge that there could be some valid reasons for that in the sense that I feel like anyone who does not both support medicalization and decriminalization, there may be some vested interests in there uh, in the sense that the medical model does, without decriminalization, it kind of maintains itself financially. There is benefit potentially for people who have a, a profit motive in the psychedelic space for maintaining uh, the, the centralized control of the substances. So I think is th this is obviously something that I don't feel like ever, I, I feel like there are really ethical players in the corporate space in, in psychedelics coming in, but there is obviously the risk there. There could be even subconscious reasons why, some, why a group or a company um, or an organization don't support decriminalization. I think it's just important to be aware of that and to therefore just have this discussion, uh, this nuanced discussion around the evidence uh, and, the, and the benefits to creating safe, genuinely safe spaces, both for those who are going to engage in the medical model, uh, both through the medical model and through ceremony, but also for those who are members of the modern mystery school. So as we know, psychedelics uh, really rely on the benefits, really rely on set and setting. The, the setting in a, in a um, criminalized culture is not going to produce the ideal benefits. So that's something just to be aware of and to, I think, to continue this conversation and to, to really, I think, hold uh, a question to those who don't support decriminalization of what, what, is the, what is the motive? Because it's not evidence-based. Many, many people have talked about psychedelics and depression. I, I say to them, when was the last time you got out of the city? And, and many of them say it's years since they've been to the bush or out of the city, out of their apartment, and into the country. And so I think a lot of us are suffering a nature deficit disorder, which psychedelics in a safe, natural environment could be infinitely more healing than a clinical one, with the right you know, setting in, in professional people. And there's incredible work um, with, with Sam and Gandhi, one of the researchers associated with Imperial and also with Synthesis, a retreat center in Amsterdam, uh, looking at how psychedelics increase our sense of connection, but also our nature relatedness and can shift uh, viewpoints on uh, environmental awareness, environmental um, contribution as well. It's like this theme of deep ecology, right? Like people that grow way too many cactus after. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I think that nature deprivation disorder is and NDD is, is something that is, is potentially quite valid, though not in the DSM. Um, and psychedelics do seem to reorient people to the world. Uh, in fact, um, Miha Csikszentmihalyi, a researcher and highly successful creative people, noted that one of the key transformative skills of those who he studied, really successful creatives, was this orientation to the world and to nature. You have another question in the front. Thank you. Um, this kind of continues on from what you were just saying, Mel. Um, do any of the panelists have comments about how psychedelics could go beyond um, just making us aware of our connection to everything, but actually be communication with plants? Um, again, I want to acknowledge I'm also a, a skeptic, even though I have some weird and wild and wonderful experiences. I still hold quite a yeah, skeptical mind. But I, I guess the um, the lineage that I work with, the the master plants that you do a diet with, uh, traditionally they have qualities. So it might be um, boundaries, it might be shape shifting into other uh, 
forms of consciousness, it might be um, intuition, and whether it's a placebo or whether it's real, I guess I've, I've had those experiences where when you sit with, with that plant in that container, um, there is this, this deeper connection which is very, um, you know, plants, plant consciousness and um, I'm attempting to write about it for the EGA journal coming up in November, <laughs> but it's, yes, very hard to put into words. Um, but, you know, that's not everyone's style, that lineage, obviously, but I think that plants, plants are everywhere, you know, they're everywhere. And I think Rosalind um, Watts's ASA model where she takes people through, uh, I think it's a 12, a 12 step process of the different, different trees in her area where people through integration, they do, you know, a deep embodied grounded meditation with, with that plant. And I think that's very transferable to, to anyone, you know, a child, an adult, um, with or without psychedelics is stepping into that teaching of, of that plant and it does speak to that disconnection that we all have from 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 earth and I'm, I'm working with uh, Kit Klein at the moment she's a, um, a Canadian na native woman with indigenous children and she runs nature-based therapies and we're, together we're very passionate about yeah nature-based therapies with, with psychedelics and without and um, hoping to have a bit of a space at the Yangs, near the Yangs in, in Lara and really cultivating, um, building clinical protocols, but into nature-based practices. You can have both. It doesn't have to be in a room. You can still have a, the clinical holding and, and safety, but within a, an expansive, yeah, container. Okay, thanks for that, Lani. Um, we've got another question down here in front from Neil, and I think one coming in from the live stream even. <laughs> There's people out there. Um, I was just going to make a quick comment, and Kate's pretty much covered it in, in what she said. I was, I was in Canberra last weekend, and Grooving the Moo was on music festival, and of course it's the insurance company companies that basically decided that they couldn't tolerate pill testing. So there's that next step that's got to be taken once we get over the political hump. Yeah. Joe is online and has asked, how has psychedelics affected people's belief systems? For example, Christianity. I'll, I'll just say one quick comment, then I'll pass it on. <laughs> I think George has got a thing or two to say. Laughing? <laughs> yeah, big question. Um, yeah, yeah, as I mentioned, I was raised, you know, evangelical Christianity with, with a big focus on hell and hell realms. Um, and how has psychedelics shifted that? I guess, uh, yeah, I, I guess it's helped me open up to the multiplicity of, of God, the God in you, the God in, in me, and the God in, in, in everything, and um, opened me up to just being able to hold multiplicity and value, you know, different lineage traditions, value the teaching of Jesus before humans destroyed it. And I, I think psychedelics can open you up to... Um, being able to walk with the, the dark night of the soul, as, as Thomas More, his incredible author, that I'll be doing a webinar with soon, if anyone's read his books, he's an incredible man, just being able to walk with the mystery and face the mystery and, and dance with the mystery, and that doesn't require doctrine or fear, or, you know, it requires courage and, yeah, lived experience. Um, as a teenager, my very nihilistic view was that I believed that God existed, but I didn't like him. Um, after my last psychedelic experience, I sort of developed this appreciation for what the universe could teach me, um, because while it was incredibly traumatic, it also left me feeling very, I hate to use the word enlightened, but I think that that was the best way I can describe it right now. Um, it, when I woke up, I had never been so relieved to be sober and it started me on a journey of wanting to get over all of my addictive behaviors, like not just with psychedelics, but with my other drugs and alcohol and stuff like that, all of these behaviors that have been holding me back for so long. Um, and it made me want to actually engage in my therapy. And so I think that that kind of coming to that conclusion all at once 
just after that one experience, that didn't happen by myself. It didn't just click with a penny drop. It was an exterior force that gave me that experience. I guess just, I would say really quick, interesting research fact. Um, what's, I find fascinating, what I find fascinating from one of the imperial observational studies of a lot of ceremonial use of psychedelics is that uh, those who were engaging in ceremonial use tend to, and over time with more frequent experiences, become more tolerant of other people's spiritual worldviews. Now, how interesting and, and valuable is that? It's not necessarily a shift in my belief, but that we can become more tolerant and open to hearing and honoring the plurality of perspectives on um, the mystery. Also, interesting work uh, with between Imperial College and MAPS. It was a study investigating ayahuasca ceremonial use between Israelis and Palestinians. And the conversations that that opened up initially, there were some tensions in the space, but by the end, they were singing each other's songs in each other's languages. So, fascinating. Yeah, I was going to say some of those same things Melissa's perfectly said. I think the tolerance, and, and even more than that, like a deep appreciation. Um, I've got a friend, one of my best friends, who's a, the best kind of Christian, very sacred, very wise, very open-minded. Um, we have some great discussions as a recovering atheist and, and, and this, this friend of mine. And what I'm going to say next, I want you to hold very, very lightly. But I had this experience once um, in an altered state where I came into contact with the, a love that was so deep and so personal that... You know, in, and in the experience, I really felt like it was the it was the love of Jesus Christ, and you know, as an atheist, that's kind of surprising. But it was so beautiful and moved me to tears so profoundly. And you know, as I came out of that experience, um, the skeptical mind, you know, had other ideas about what that could have been. But I felt like for the first time, I actually experienced the kind of love that Christians are talking about. And I and I still have that feel. I know what that I know what that is now. That's not just an idea that that Christians talk about. It's a thing, and I felt it. And as I said, I want you to hold that lightly. But now I can connect with my my friend on a totally different level, and we can speak and 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 postulate about what this could have been, and then we can talk about ontology and philosophy and all that sort of stuff. But from a deep kind of feeling sense, of I kind of I got I got that. So yeah, I just wanted to say that it can really open up. I think, a, a shared understanding of the world and, and, and ways to begin it. Actually, a funny anecdote about Christianity. I, after, after reading Nietzsche, I told my mum that God is dead and I would never be a Christian. She, was, she grew up a, a Catholic and tried to get me confirmed and all these things. Um, it obviously brought a lot of tension between us. And it was when I told her, actually, Mom, psychedelics brought me to God. <laughs> that she uh, decided she'd be willing to take them herself. Wow. <laughs> wow. Such a rich discussion. I wonder if there are any more questions in the audience. Not yet. We do have time for a couple more questions, if that's right with the panel. Yeah. Um, one of the ones that came from the community is uh, uh, why has LSD taken a back seat? I think it's an interesting question. I think just one point is its, uh, it's most other commonly used name is acid, <laughs> which isn't necessarily, uh, doesn't really engender itself to the scientific or perhaps on a chemistry level, but in, not at the therapeutic necessarily uh, domain. And there was a lot of um, unfortunate uh, stereotyping of, of LSD in the 60s, which I think had carried through up to when psychedelic research restarted. The Renaissance began with a DMT study. No one had ever heard of dimethyltryptamine in the media, so that was sort of allowed through. And psilocybin, what's that? So there actually was a, just a practical cultural concern there. The other aspect is its duration. 
12 hours, that's a, that's a long time to pay a psychiatrist. <laughs> a long time to sit with someone on acid. <laughs> that, that too, two psychiatrists or, you know, two psychologists or two counsellors, whatever it is, is still a lot of energy for someone to hold. Uh, I do still think that there is a lot of value in LSD. In fact, a colleague, Vince Polito in Sydney, has just recently uh, been approved a microdosing study using LSD, one of the largest microdosing studies. I think it's the largest microdosing study that's ever been approved, and it's actually in a clinical format, which is really great news. So research has now started. Um, Plus it has a slightly worse risk profile because of the cardiac stuff, I think. It just like, looks slightly more risky, so why go with the risky option when no one wants to do psychedelic research? Mm. Say, psilocybin safety profile? Mm. <laughs> looks good. And that being said, I think that there is a real, um, real need to open up the varieties of psychedelic experience because there are actually hundreds of psychedelics, uh, different slight variations on the base, uh, molecular backbones or tryptamines and phenylethylamines. And there are some really valuable ones out there. For example, mescaline, which we both discussed, has some uh, pharmacological similarities uh, that are unique. I only think DOM, uh, which is another rare psychedelic. This one goes for 30 hours. So that's going to that's, that's take a while to study. It's a lot of caffeine or modafinil for the therapists. <laughs> Probably not wise, but mescaline and a few other psychedelics, not many, have some similarities to MDMA. So there could be particular use cases for, for trauma, for example. The, these different flavors of psychedelic experience, I think, are all really valuable and worthwhile exploring. Likewise, the 2C compounds, 2CB, 2CE, 2CI, uh, again, have potential for the treatment of trauma because they are both psychedelics and intactogens and potentially even have a better safety profile than MDMA. Thank you. We have another... Yeah, sorry for anyone who just didn't hear what I just said. Um, mm. The last question was about LSD taking a back seat. And I personally believe that mescaline is almost overlooked completely. Now, um, obviously, Liam... <laughs> Myself and possibly other people in the crowd tonight will agree. Now, Melissa, you just referred to the fact with LSD that it's a 12-hour journey. Mescaline can be significantly longer than that. Do you think that's the reason that it may be overlooked? I mean, mescaline was, it's the original. It's the original psychedelic, the first one to be studied, the first one to be isolated. And um, now it's relegated. It doesn't seem to get anywhere near the attention of anything else. I'll pass it back to Melissa in a second, but yeah, I, I, I love mescaline personally. It's incredible. Um, and I've seen, I work really closely with a lot of, particularly women in the community who use mescaline f to treat sexual abuse. And they do that in, in a community by the fireplace in, in ceremony, in, in a secular but ritualised uh, setting, and I'm a, I'm a huge supporter of mescaline, and hope you know, hopefully, one day we can co-create some some research together because it's yeah, un, untapped um, knowing of how it can address particularly yeah, line, lineage, intergenerational trauma, and um, yeah, sexual abuse. Yeah, it's this very special compound, and it, it, some people describe it as the original psychedelic, particularly in the West. Uh, there is actually a group researching mescaline called Journey Collab. It is a for-profit company, but I will say that they've made a lot of headway in creating strong relationship um, with North American churches and communities. And just want to honour the fact that mescaline and the use of mescaline was seen as a great threat to uh, the colonial invaders uh, observing the use of mescaline and it was quickly outlawed and banned and there's a lot of trauma there and also even the uh, peyotes there's, there's concerns over the sustainability of the plant in North America and I think it's really important that we work with the the knowledge holders uh, and lineage traditions and, and just yeah hold, hold the healing 
as we do begin to research mescaline, because I think there's a lot of potential there. I think uh, I like how Michael Pollan in, in his book describes uh, describes it as um, a psychedelic that holds you in, in this world more so than potentially other other realms. Of course, they're invited in, but they're, they're almost uh, more synergistic and there's a real embodiment with mescaline. And I think the potential for holding and navigating both, both trauma but um, transcendent realms at once through this uh, connectedness to heart and loving wisdom. And journeys, can, not always, but can be a little bit more gentle than psilocybin, which I think for, I think for many, is, it would be a really attractive feature of, of therapy. So yeah, I have high hopes that, that, that there will be a lot more research on mescaline, because it is a really special substance. Yeah, I think um, the nausea is an additional thing um, that discourages people from using it, as well as in, in this clinical setting. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think uh, using um, plant-based mescaline would be another even more complicated thing, right, to get that in a clinical study. Um, but this conservation aspect that you mentioned is also um, a, a factor. And in the, uh, I don't know if I'll get the details exactly correct, but decriminalized nature movement somewhere in the US, recent rescheduling of a number of plant-based psychedelics and the exemption of peyote from this scheduling because of a concern for conservation issues. But um, the thing is, it looks like uh, peyote is monopolized by one particular branch of an indigenous group, which is great they have access, but there are actually other indigenous groups that don't have access. Um, but peyote conservation is a very like, confusing, difficult politics. Simple message, eat San Pedro, not peyote. It grows faster, it grows like a weed, it's cheaper, it's legal. Just keep your peyote, it's more valuable. You don't need to eat it. Wow, well, um, I am nervous to say that we're coming to the end because it's such a rich, amazingly valuable um, group of people that we have all together. Can you please put your hands together in appreciation for our amazing panel?